everyone, I'm Byung, I work at Sourcegraph, and today I want to talk to you about some patterns and examples that we came up with building Sourcegraph as a Go web app, and just want to share that with you and get your thoughts about it. So, just really quick for some context, oh, by the way, feel free to interrupt me at any point in this talk uh, if you want to ask a question. Uh, you'll actually get a, a t free t-shirt like this if you do, so there's your incentive. What's that? Oh, sorry. Set. All right, cool. Um, okay, so first off, just a little context, uh, who we are and why we're talking about building Go web apps. So Sourcegraph is a source code engine written in Go. So who here has heard of Sourcegraph before? Okay, cool, uh, a lot of you. Uh, for those of you who don't know what it is, it's a source code engine, uh, source code search engine written in Go, and one of the things it does that's unique to it, um, that's not in other code search engines, is that it indexes things at a semantic level, so it actually goes through and parses the code, and understands what functions are and what function calls are, and serves you that instead of indexing just the plain text. So you can actually search directly for functions and types and packages by name and it supports Go and several other languages. And when you search for something on Sourcegraph, you jump to the definition of where that thing is in code, and you also see usage examples of how other people use that particular piece of code, how they're calling it, who else is using it, things like that. And the high-level motivation behind building Sourcegraph was that we had this pain that we felt as programmers where you know, we wanted to more easily figure out how to use other people's code and explore around it and see what patterns and best practices they did. So what this does is it makes it easier to jump around code, jump to definition, find usages, things like that. And uh, just as a side note, it's free to use and is also going to be mostly open source soon. We're gonna open source a lot of the language analysis packages that we use. So if you're interested in building things like editor plugins or browser extensions or just developer tools in general and want to take advantage of you know, this library that parses the code and you know, resolves references and things like that, come talk to me afterwards. So I'm here to talk about building Go web apps, uh, but I'm not here to talk about how we build sourcegraph.com actually. So that actually is another talk. So if anyone here was at Google I.O., uh, did anyone here see our Google I.O. talk? Okay, uh, just very few of you. So if you're interested in learning um, or seeing how we built sourcegraph.com, there is a, a talk that covers that. It covers a lot of the same patterns and principles I'm gonna just discuss here, but the difference is that this talk is gonna focus on a different uh, web app that we built using these principles and is now completely open source. Oh, and there's also another talk uh, specifically about testing. So this talk is how we applied the patterns and examples we came up with while building Sourcegraph.com to build a cool Go web app in under 24 hours. So what is the site actually? So it's called thesource.org. It's actually live right now. And it sort of grew out of uh, this personal dream that we had that, you know, what if there was a community site out there where you could share links and that were specifically just about programming and code, and it didn't have things like, you know, how I hacked my latest funding round, or how the NSA is reading your email, or just random Silicon Valley gossip. So um, we just decided to, hey, let's try and build this thing. And we also view this as sort of our contribution to the conversation that's happening in the Go community about how to structure and build web apps. So we think that, you know, what we've come up with are a lot of general, repeatable patterns that hopefully will help other people when they're building their own Go web apps. So not only is the site live, but the code is you know, on GitHub. It's completely open source. Check it out right now. And you know, send us feedback. Um, so that's what it looks like. It's, it looks very similar to your typical link sharing uh, site. Right now it just pulls from Hacker News and uh, the programming subreddit and just hides all the links that don't actually contain uh, code snippets. So it looks for like code and pre-tags and HTML. Um, so let's get back to the problem at hand, which is how do we build and structure uh, a good Go web app? So what I've 
I'm, what I'm showing here is essentially like the platonic form of what the source uh, the source.org does. So I've reduced it to just three things, and I've listed them in a representation that hopefully everyone here will understand. A Go interface, right? So what does a web app? What does this particular web app actually do? It lets you you know get a post. It lets you list a bunch of posts, and it lets you submit a post. And that's what you do as a user, um, and that's what that's what the app does, right? So remember this slide. This is what it does. Um, and a quick aside, you know, in general, what makes a good, you know, web application? Obviously, it needs to be functional. It needs to support the functionality that I just showed, or whatever the spec is. Uh, it needs to be performant. Uh, it'd be nice if there was an API to interact with it. Uh, but more importantly, you know, how how should the code be structured? Um, and you know, one, you know, high level principle is DRY, dry or don't repeat yourself. Uh, basically, what that means is, you know, you don't want to write repetitive code because then it's not going to be readable, it's going to be a pain to maintain because you're going to have to make updates in multiple places, and it's going to be hard to test because you're going to you know, have to basically repeat yourself in tests as well, and that sort of de-incentivizes you from writing tests. So what is the, what is the architecture, quote unquote, uh, of a typical web app and this particular web app look like? So you know, this should be fairly familiar to everyone here. Um, the user issues an HTTP request by navigating to a URL in the browser. That hits the web front end server. That server, in turn, uh, calls the API server, issues an HTTP request to the API server, uh, which then issues a request to uh, the database. The database returns that data. That data gets marshaled at the API level as something like JSON. Um, and then in the web front end, it takes that JSON and stuffs it into some sort of HTML rendering system and returns HTML to the user. So to start with, you know, looking at this picture, uh, the starting point for many people when they start to build a web application is to think about how to tie all this together. Um, so what is like the framework that you're fitting this all into? So we actually didn't use a uh, traditional web framework. What we found is that we were able to get really far just using the things in the Go standard library and a few narrowly focused third party libraries, you know, like Gorilla Mux for URL routing and you know, uh, the model or modal library for interacting with our database. And really on top of that, we just implemented a couple of helper functions that sort of you know, do things that web applications commonly do, like render some HTML or, you know, marshal some JSON. So this slide has a lot of code, but, you know, again, all the code is open source online GitHub, so check it out if you want to see, if you want to dive into it. So that's sort of like the high level, you know, how are we tying all this together? Now, you know, what about getting back to those high level goals about what makes a good web app? You know, and one, one of the things was don't repeat yourself. So how are we going to eliminate repetition in this design? Because if you think about it, there's a lot of repeated logic here. You know, the web front end is doing something. It's running HTML, but it has to interact with the same data structures um, conceptually as the API and the data store, right? So remember that platonic form of what the app, web app was. Um, I wrote it as a Go interface to describe it succinctly. And that's, it describes what it is both at like a UI level all the way down to you know, the, the database level. And one of the things that we found is we could actually make it a literal interface in our code. And that this interface actually is common, it's implemented by you know, all three layers essentially. So you know, at, at the API layer, you're gonna have something that you know, gets a post, uh, what that's gonna do is it's gonna talk to the, the data store layer. Um, same thing for list and submit, right? And at the, the web front end layer, it's essentially doing the same thing, it's just gonna talk to the API layer instead of talking to the data store, right? So they're the same interface, they just have different implementations. So this is what you know the implementation of the API client would look like. Um, so again, you know, what you're asking it to do is get you a post, which is simple. What it does underneath the hood is it just constructs the URL, it issues 
a request for that URL to the API, which returns it as JSON, and then it decodes that JSON and returns the post. And then again, uh, for the data store, you know, you're gonna ask the data store for a post, but instead of you know, doing what the API client did, it's gonna issue a SQL query and get the data from the database and return it to you. Uh, any questions so far? Oh, dollar one is just, uh, it's just embedding the argument into the SQL, the ID argument. So that's just how this particular package does it. Anyone lost? I know it's a lot of code. Okay. Can I assume one row? What's that? Can I assume one row? Uh, yeah, so this, this code might be a little like reformatted for display purposes. <laughs> um, okay, so now we've made those two things implement the same interface. So that sort of buys us kind of like nice, you know, code style. They're implementing the same interface. It feels good. Um, but what about, you know, oh, another thing is that if you end up changing that interface, uh, it will break the layers at compile time if you haven't updated them. So instead of you know, making, deciding you want to change something on the front end and then, oops, like I forgot to change the interface in the subsequent layers because you know, they don't actually implement the same interface in code um, and find that error at runtime, uh, now you have like a compile time guarantee that they actually implement this interface which describes what your app does. Uh, but more than just that, it helps you simplify a lot of things. So it specifically, you know, we sort of cast each of these layers as implementing that interface. And the thing that sort of sits between the layers are these HTTP handlers. And when you first start writing a web app, you might stuff a lot of logic in the HTTP handlers. So in addition to just uh, you know, handling the HTTP requests, it does a lot of other things, like it talks to the layers below it, things like that. Now, by using you know, this common interface, you can make it so that the HTTP handlers just deal with parsing and handling the HTTP request and then immediately forwards that to you know, the API client or data store which handles talking to the layers below it. So it's sort of nice encapsulation. And that happens both you know, at the front end server level and the API server level. So there's the, the diagram again, just to refresh your memory. And another thing that we can do is we can unify the routing and generation of routes. So one common thing that happens when you implement a web app and you want to you know, create an API client for it is you have your nice URL router which defines all your routes really nicely and it's great. And then you go to implement the API client and what happens is you hard code a lot of these routes into the API client because you don't want your API client to depend on the API server, that would be terrible, right? So you just hard code it. And then what happens when you change your, the definition of the routes in your API server? It breaks the API client, right? So what we did is we actually extracted the router component of the API server so that now there's a separate router package that both the API client and the API server depend upon. And all the router package does is define the routes. It doesn't actually attach handlers to the routes. That's done um, in the API server package. So that allows us to basically you know, do nice route generation in the API client that will not break if you change the definition of your API routes. Oh, and so you can also apply this to the front end uh, server if it's similar enough to your API server. And in this case it is because all we're doing is getting and creating posts. There's nothing fancy happening in the front end. It's a very thin layer on top of the API. Uh, yeah, that's basically what I just said. And then another, th another nice win we get from this is we can share parameters across layers. So you know, for any given endpoint in your API or your web app, you're gonna wanna pass some query parameters to that. So like, you know, when you list 
all the definitions in a repository in Sourcegraph, for instance. You want to define some sort order, like sort by how many people use it. You pass that as a query parameter, and in a, you know, if you're not doing it, if you're doing it sort of the naive way, you end up repeating the definition of those options at each layer, right? Because each layer has to sort of parse those, uh, unmarshal them, remarshal them, pass them on to the next layer, uh, and now they're just completely shared. Uh, and finally, another win we get is it makes it a lot easier to test because all three layers implement this common interface and we can mock that interface by essentially you know, this struct. This struct implements that platonic form of the app, that interface, and all it contains is a bunch of stub functions that you can override in your test to you know, mimic whatever layer is above or below the layer that you're testing right now. And yeah, it, it just makes it so you don't have to repeat that at each layer. So it makes it you know, less work on your part to test this application well. And another win is if you're releasing your API client to the public, you can also release the mock to that API client. And so not only are your tests nice, but other people who are using and building on top of your API can also have nice tests. And just obviously a high level, a general win of using mocks is that um, you're only testing one part of the, your application at a time and the tests will run super fast because they're not gonna hit the database or anything like that. So there it is again, uh, the sort of generic web app architecture diagram. Um, hopefully all the things that I covered, uh, you can sort of fit into this picture. Is there any questions about, yeah? Oh, so the question is, how did we get our API client to be dry? Uh, did we have to essentially re-implement it in JavaScript? And the answer is, so the HTML in our app is actually generated server-side. So the front end is written in Go. If we had, you know, like a single page JavaScript app, we would have to re-implement a lot of this stuff in JavaScript. Yeah. Any other questions? Yep. What's that? Oh, uh, you're asking about how we do the encoding and decoding of uh, the parameters. So these these are just some small third party libraries that just make it easier to you know, go from a Go struct to a query stream and vice versa. Yeah, so that's all that is. Uh, and once again, the code is all online, so if you want to check it out and see how it's done in practice. Yeah. Um, so, do you want to come talk to me afterwards? Yeah. It's a bit much to get in there. <laughs> yeah. Password recovery. So you did this in 24 hours, so I'm curious, after you finished it, what design decision do you, do you wish you like, could go back and refactor if you were going to do another 24 hour like, jam? Yeah, so, I think, what, so one of the things is originally, um, let me go back. So this slide, this, this thing is actually something that we noticed that when we were making this new app in, in actual sourcegraph.com, we separated the definition of the API routing from the you know, app server front end routing. And in this case, the you know, platonic form, that interface was actually simple enough that we could actually combine both of those in the same package. 
So it was just an, another place where we could eliminate repetition. Any other questions? I have one question. Yeah. Is there, you know what, I ended up using, um, is, is, what kind of build tool do you like to use? A build tool? Yeah. Um, go install? Or, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we just use the standard, okay. yeah. Uh, although, so we do, we use GoDep for dependency management. That's the only kind of kink in that. Okay, I'm just gonna move on really quick. Um, okay, so once again, the code is online. The directory structure is pretty much maps out to what I just described. Um, and let's just revisit our goals really quick. So obviously it's functional. You can check it out at source, the source.org. Um, it's performant because the Go standard library is very performant and you know, you saw all the other libraries that we use. It's a very thin layer on top of what the standard library provides. And the code itself is, is very dry. You know, we unified the URL routing, the route generation, um, all that other stuff. The interfaces are, are easy to mock, so it's, it's testable. And, you know, we almost got the high quality API client as a side effect of ripping that out that interface. Because all the API client does is implement that interface and just issue HTTP requests underneath that. Um, so as a meta points, uh, the, the slides of this talk are, are up here. Um, oh, and you know, how did we come up with these patterns? Um, so we didn't just pull them out of thin air. We actually got to them by reading through a lot of the code in the standard lib and also third party libraries that we used and observing the patterns and examples of how people are doing things there. And I think that's a really good way of uh, sort of like leveling up as a programmer in a given language is to see what other people are, are doing. And I think Sourcegraph is a really good tool for doing that because you can just easily explore code, click on links. And finally, a disclaimer, you know, this approach is what worked for us at Sourcegraph and also building the source. But obviously it's not the end all be all, you know, Bible of how to build web apps and go. So we want your feedback, we want you to tell us what's stupid or wrong about this approach and what we can do better. And Check out the source.org and let us know what you think. Uh, any questions? Yeah. Yeah, I'll add the meetup. Sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, such as like, you know, you know, when you have more complicated request response cycles, like logging uh, everything that went into a specific request or, or, or something like that, yeah. um, or authentication. Um, uh, so I sort of glossed over this point. But when I was talking about like our quote unquote framework, uh, what we actually do is, so Go makes it really easy to compose HTTP handlers. So you can, you know, wrap, you know, you have your handler that actually implements your application logic, but you also have these other things that you want to do for every request, like logging or authentication, things like that. So what we actually do is when we define um, our actual, you know, app logic handlers, we wrap them, this is a typo, it's not a wrapper function, but it's, we wrap them in a type. And what that type does is it implements uh, the HTTP handle function. So it is an HTTP handler. And inside, uh, its HP, uh, sorry, inside its handle function, it does all the things that you want to do for each request, like auth and logging, and then calls the function that it wraps. If it gets an error, it writes an HTTP error to the, the response writer. Otherwise, it just returns whatever or, sorry, it doesn't return, it just, you know, passes on the, the response. So, so what if, what if something down this call stack need more data from, from one of your, like the auth, right? You want to check auth data somewhere down the call stack. How do you, how do you pass that data? Yeah, so there's a, a third party lib called, um, uh, it's gorilla slash context, I think, which allows you to set context variables for a given HTTP request. And so, you can set that context data in a you know upstream handler and then access it in 
in the downstream handles. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, other frameworks besides using Gorilla for routing? Um, what was the question? Oh, sorry. The question was, uh, do I know of any other frameworks for URL routing besides Gorilla? Um, I, I don't know any off the top of my head, actually. Does anyone else know any? Frameworks like Oh, there, there's uh, URL routers and, and Go frameworks that take the more traditional framework approach. There's, there's a popular called HTTP router. HTTP router? HTTP router. HTTP router. I'll check that out. Sorry, what was the wrapper? Another one called HTTP Router and another one called Jin. HTTP Router and Jin. Check those out. Any other questions? All right, cool. Thank you very much for having me.